Our next speaker is Emily King. Emily is the Program Manager of Research and Extension at AWR. She hails from central New South Wales and has always worked in agriculture. She began her career with Australian Livestock and Property, Property Agents Association before moving to AWI in 2012. Emily's worked on a number of team, in a number of teams at AWI, but currently fulfills that role of program manager. And she's responsible for the reproduction and nutrition research portfolio and grow extension development. Today she'll talk about the investigation AWI did into shearing shed design and how it's led to improvements in the way shearing sheds can be set up in the future. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Lovely to be back in South Australia again. It's nice to be anywhere again, frankly, but always love coming to South Australia. So thank you very much for having me. I am going to have a chat today about um, shearing shed safety uh, and design and etc. cetera. Uh, has anyone had trouble getting shearers lately? No one, excellent. That's good. This is, this is very, this is very good. Um, we've had a lot of reports of uh, people having a real hard time getting shearers um, from uh, right across Australia, apparently, except for the Barossa, so that's wonderful. Um, so I guess, from our point of view, why are we investing your levy in shearing shed design um, and training and uh, technologies in shearing sheds? And I guess the simple answer is because at this stage, farmers need shearers, shearers need farmers. And so we need shearers to stay in the game. Um, at the moment, uh, we have a good attraction program going, but where we think we need to focus is on retention and keeping good shearers in the game and keeping them shearing and making sure that they're not broken down and crippled at 30 years of age and they can keep having a safe working place and environment and um, continue shearing very well and have a long career in that. So we do a lot in training for uh, shearers and wool handlers and, um, and then, but we've also been looking at some um, shed safety and shed design features. So I'll take you through some of those as well. Um, as well, some of the wearable technology that we've had on shearers and then what we think that might be able to tell us in terms of, you know, maybe is one design better than another or is one training method better than another, things like that. And then also some shed safety, some free guides and that sort of thing that we've got available if you would like to use those. So has anyone built a new shed in the last 10 years? Anyone um, done any refitting to an old shed, done a few improvements? Yeah, cool, okay. Well, hopefully there's something here for everyone. Um, hopefully a lot of these things I'm going to talk about um, you're already looking at, but um, of course I will be around for the rest of the day to have a chat um, or any questions at the end of this. So when we started the Shearing Shed Design Project, um, first of all we wanted to do a survey out to um, shearers, wool handlers, wool classes, etc., people who work in shearing sheds. And we asked them to rate, based on all the different features in a shearing shed, what impact they had on different parts of their working day. So in terms of animal welfare, safety of workers, efficiency and flow through the shed, their ability to do a quality job, all those types of things. Then we took a group of growers and shed staff out on a shearing shed tour, went through all of the features of all the sheds, and thought what works, what doesn't. Then we worked through a prototype design and workshop. We evaluated that, trialed it, you know, made mock-ups in plywood, that sort of thing, moved through that a number of times, developed a blueprint, and, um, and then the wool grower and shearing contractor who was working with us on the project built the shed. A lot of people ask us why AWI is out paying to build people's shearing sheds. We're not. We did not pay to build a shearing shed. We paid to do the consultation process and have the blueprint and designs done so that then we can share those with the whole of industry. So all of those designs and everything are all up on the internet. Anyone can get those. You can amend them as you see fit. You can build it as it is. You can do whatever you like with it. So um, all of that is on our website, but I'm going to take you through some of that now. So I guess, as I said before, we wanted to design a shed that was safer for the people that work in it, that presents minimal risk or mitigates as many risks as we possibly can for animal welfare purposes, and more efficient um, in moving sheep and in getting sheep to the shearer, but then also in uh, wool flow away from the shearer as well, and allow, importantly, for quality wool preparation. So through the shed design tour, they toured through six sheds. There was 13 people on that. As I said, mixture of growers, shed staff, etc. Toured around and 
pointed out all of the parts of the shed that they liked and parts that they didn't like. And they rated each of those based on how it impacted those four key areas of safety, welfare, efficiency, flow, and wool quality prep. So from that then, there were some key improvements that were coming back through the survey and through the physical um, tour process that then we thought were the key improvements that were identified and then allowed us to start designing. So one of the key things was inefficient pen flow, um, backfill, pen sizes, all that sort of thing. So just making it really hard and leading you to have to shimmy sheep around all the time in the back pens. Dragging sheep long distances and around corners was identified as something that um, is really difficult. Um, ruins efficiency and also tough on the shearers and tough on the shed staff having to get around the shearers all the time and stay out of their way. Um, small and uninviting shoots which were hampering release um, and so making it very difficult for the shearer to pull out a gear and get the sheep down the chute. Um, long and uneven distances which were ruining efficiency and flow in the shed so between um, between the wool table and the shearer or from the table to the bins, those sorts of things. And of course, workplace quality, safety and satisfaction. So you can see there that is a plywood mock-up. And so what we did was we built one stand. We sort of got all these ideas together, got everyone to put down what do you think is the best way to set this thing up. And then we built a plywood mock-up. And so then, you know, it was cheap and quick and dirty. And so then if something didn't work, you just unscrew it, chop the side off it and shimmy it around and put it on a different angle or whatever so that it was really, really movable. So this video here is one of the um, early prototypes. So as you can see here, when the shearer finishes, those front feet fall into the chute at the finish um, when he pulls out of gear. And then he'll go back into the pen in a minute and you'll be able to see the straight drag as well. So you can see that sheep just goes straight down the chute from where he finishes. So he doesn't have to twist around and push the sheep down the chute. And then just a straight drag out of the pen onto the hand piece. So this is still in that plywood. So this is just in an old shed that they were going to knock down anyway. So they just chopped the guts out of it and um, started building the prototype in there so that we could start testing. So from that we ended up, so this is um, one stand and it's, um, and it's um, catching pen and fill pens. And so what you can see highlighted there in blue, that's the catching pen. And so then it's a straight drag from there out onto the down tube. And then from where the sheep finishes the last position that the sheep's in at the end of shearing, straight down the chute as well. That then translates into this six module design. And, um, and so, um, I've got these plans if you'd like to see this in more detail um, and we also have plans on the website but we can also supply the CAD files as well if you want to give them to your engineer or builder etc. So this is one module here so the straight drag through the pen doors onto the down tube and then down the chute and here is a view of um, this shed from, from the um, that was taken out of one of the rafters um, and so you can see that's that six stand design for this shed. So we'll start from the back of the shed and work our way through and out to the wool room. So um, key features that were identified that, um, that everyone thought were essential were covered external yards, um, a really good wide ramp for easy access and entry to the yards. There's a walkway and rail on the side of that ramp for easy access for people pushing sheep up the ramp. Um, inside the shed, all of the back areas are with... Um, soft grip flooring, so they're all plastic flooring that is multi-directional and it's quite deep. It's about 40 mil deep to stop too much light coming up through it. The sides of this shed have, they've put the tin right down the side so that it goes all the way down to the ground as well to stop too much light coming in under the shed as well to stop sheep balking coming in. Um, there is boarded fence to improve flow, welfare and reduce the noise as well. Um, and there's wide swing gates and swing slide gates throughout the whole shed to improve uh, movement and flow of the sheep. So there we have that modular design. Um, the horseshoe design um, is to minimise the distance from any stand um, to the tables. Um, and the blueprint design is designed so that this can be structurally independent of the shed. Um, and so it's not actually tied into the shed. 
In terms of the laneway fill and catching pens, um, the pen sizing is built so that the back pen and side pens, they basically hold about 70 sheep, which on industry average is about two runs worth of sheep. Um, on the, just here you can see these pens are sloping, so you can see that wedge there. Um, these pens are sloping upwards. Um, the slatted floor is in the direction of the drag, parallel to the drag, so it's easier for the shearer to drag the sheep back out. Um, and so just for, um, just for, sorry, human safety, we've just painted that um, yellow um, high-vis strip there, um, just for that step up from um, the fill pen into the catching pen. And so all the sheep come straight in there and turn straight up the hill and are then presented away from the shearer, so it's easy for them to drag out as well. Um, the catching pen is free from obstacles, for example, the chute, um, which is um, why we didn't want, um, you know, apart from the release down the chute is a key reason for why the chute was not put in there. The catching pen doors, a lot of the shearers reported to us that they, um, if the pen doors are too high, they get quite sore elbows from dragging back and their elbows being the first thing to hit the pen door as they come out. Um, what they also reported was generally happening was if they, um, if their elbows are getting quite sore, what they end up doing is starting bending over. So it's their bum that hits the door first, not their elbows. And so then they're out of position and sort of standing over the top of the sheep trying to drag back, um, which is obviously not good for their back either. So their suggestion was that um, you have double swing doors and that they're quite low. So they're at about bum height um, for the shearer so that there's nothing in their upper body that is catching as they go through. Also recommended a gap between the doors um, and across the bottom. So in a sloped catching pen, you need a gap on the bottom, of course, because when the door swings inwards, the slope is going up. So you need to make sure it doesn't catch on the catching pen floor. But um, then as well, so that you've got less chance of um, shearers' feet getting wedged or something like that if they step backwards, um, and also for sheep as well. Um, the sh those um, catching pen doors are still high enough to bulk the sheep. Um, in this design, the sheep do come in and very rapidly turn to go up that sloped pen. Um, but I guess, um, you know, if you do have problems, if you're trying to retrofit um, an old shed and change your pen door height, um, there are, we've got some suggestions coming up for what they said um, could probably help. Um, so you might have noticed in the pictures that I showed you earlier, um, the shed that was built at Dubbo, which is where this prototype shed is sitting, is a flat board. Um, and so I guess where we landed was that basically whether or not you'd like a raised or flat board is personal preference. But the reason that that was built as a flat board uh, was because the bloke whose place that's on, um, he is a shearing contractor and a wool grower. Um, and he said that a lot of his shearers have most of the injuries that he gets um, are from his shearers being turfed off a raised board. Um, so he said, you know, that's a big impact on my business and that's something um, I don't want to have happen. Um, a lot of his wool handlers said we're more than happy to um, do our job on a flat board and we would actually prefer it. Um, a lot of people say that the board height never seems to be at the right spot. So, you know, if you're too short or too tall for that board, you end up with problems because, and um, often the board is either at a great depth for the shearer or a great depth for the wool handler. And um, quite often we get reports that, you know, it's quite difficult to get that right so that the wool handler can do their job adequately. Um, the wool handlers and shearers also said that it's more difficult for the wool handler to get up and assist the shearer should they need to if something goes wrong. Um, and a lot of the wool handlers also reported that they feel quite unsafe going in close to, you know, get the crutch out or something because then it's the sheep's foot or the handpiece that's right in their face as they're leaning in. And so I think as well, if you imagine that, you know, if you're pressed up against the board and you're at full stretch, if something happens, it's very hard for you to react to that and get out of the way as well. So they were the reasons that this was built a flat board. Having said that, there's also many reasons for people to want a raised board, um, and that is absolutely your decision. So here's the chute. Um, so this chute is, um, the opening of it is 800 by 800 mil. Um, and so there's a vertical drop-off at 
the chute entrance and the chute is also recessed into the board. So a lot of people um, are of course worried about their shearer falling down the chute given the wide opening of it and etc. So that's why this chute is only 800 mils tall because there's such a deep recess. So the recess on this is about that deep. The drop off into that chute is about 200 mil deep. So when a shearer gets near that, if they do get out of position and get too close to that, when they're bent over, their bum will catch the top rail of that chute and they won't go down there. Um, as an uninterrupted chute exit, um, the top um, of that chute has, we would suggest that it either you put rubber matting on it or wood to stop vibration and um, to improve the surface and reduce noise in the shed. Um, I guess the other, the other key thing, um, and I've got a video coming up to show you as well um, in this shed, but quite often when people start shearing um, or as they move through the day, where that Evo is sitting up on the top rail there, you can adjust, you can move the Evo to anywhere you like and adjust the down tube positioning in this shed. So you can just keep moving it across the rail. So quite often shearers were saying to us, you know, towards, you know, as they move through the runs in the day, they just move the Evo over a little bit um, if the sheep weren't quite dropping in the right spot, like if they were finishing shearing and their sheep weren't falling down the chute. So there's a video here now. And so you can see that shearer is about to um, finish there and that sheep sitting on top of the chute and the front legs just drop straight down. So in terms of uh, wool handling in the wool room, um, we try to create as even as possible and short distances um, between all the stands and the wool table and really importantly a flexible configuration. All the whole floor of this shed is load rated so that the presses can be moved anywhere you like. So, you know, if you're crutching and you've only got a couple of stands running or something, you can move the press closer um, or whatever you'd like to do. Portable um, wool bins, wool table and presses. All of the wool tables in this shed are adjustable, so height adjustable, so that if you've got a shorter team or a taller team working, you can just move those up and down. Um, recommendation was for boarded wool bins instead of using mesh side wool bins. Um, and um, there's a lot of lighting in this shed, so um, you know, just really important to have consistently well lit um, shed. In terms of amenities, um, toilets are non-negotiable. They're required by law. Um, they, you know, toilets just have to be at every shed. There's just no getting around that. Um, at Keith, um, a guy asked if I you know, I don't shear for that long every year. Would it be okay if I just hired some port and had them at the shed? Absolutely, it's a great solution. You know, um, if that's what you'd like to do, that's absolutely fine. As long as there are clean working toilets there for everybody to use, absolutely fine. Hot and cold running water um, and a large deep sink so that shearers can get in there and really wash right up their arms. Um, and one good suggestion that the shearers had was instead of using a normal faucet to use a shower head because they can, you know, move it around quite easily and it's quite easy to get their arms under and get a decent wash. Um, a separate enclosed kitchen space with clean preparation surfaces uh, and kitchen accessories and table and chairs provided as well in the lunchroom. In terms of general features, I uh, mentioned before, the tin on this shed goes all the way down to the bottom to stop minimal unwanted light getting in under the shed. Um, a separate grinding area. Um, there's large windows and shutters to improve airflow in the shed and there is a really, really big air conditioner installed in this shed as well, as well as some fans. Um, shed safety signage and first aid kit, fire extinguisher, emergency stop buttons. If you are going to have a raised board, there should be emergency stop buttons for all the stands. Um, and the um, directions, coordinates and contact numbers. So um, quite often in a lot of sheds there's no service um, and people don't know, you know, they know how to get to the shed but they don't know exactly where they are. Uh, and so there was a case in New South Wales um, where a young lady had gone out to the shed to visit some family members who were working in the shed um, and she had an injured arm so she wasn't working at the time and she jumped up into a wool bin to tamp it down and her hair got caught in the overhead gear and scalped her in the shed. So um, that, that shed um, 
they knew where they were, but not exactly to direct the ambulance to. So the ambulance was going to take over an hour to get there. And so um, her dad was actually in the shed that day and he ended up driving her into town. So I guess just um, having that clearly written somewhere in the shed so that everyone in the shed knows exactly where they are, if they have to call for help, they can give those directions straight away um, to help emergency services find them if that's required. All of this is available on our website. There's um, videos um, showing you through all the shed and um, having a chat with a lot of people who were involved in the consultation process, all the shearers and um, wool handlers, um, people who have actually worked in the shed, um, giving a first-hand opinion of how it all works. Um, also drawings, more information, etc. But as I said, happy to have a chat to anyone and we've got all the engineered CAD drawings for you if you would like those. So I guess in summary, some of the key fit out tips that came through time and time again, um, swing slide gates are really handy, limiting light beneath the shed, um, having catching pen timber slats parallel to the drag really helps, um, really helps shearers bring the sheep out, sloping pen if you can do it as well is wonderful, um, lower dual timber doors. 50-50 um, or, you know, if you're retrofitting a shed and that's not going to work or, you know, if the pen door would then end up being too wide and would um, be coming across and impinging where the handpiece is and etc., um, try 75-25 or 70-30. Uh, um, also, if, um, if your sheep have a habit of putting pressure on the <laughs> catching pen doors as the pen's filling, um, suggestion is to keep the lower doors but put a third barn style door on top so just for filling so that then you can open that back up across the pen once the, um, once the shearer um, starts um, dragging out of the pen again. Um, I guess we would suggest that you remove overhead gear. It's a safety nightmare um, if you can and, um, and replace that with independent um, shearing plant on every stand. Um, it's much high performance and a lot safer. Um, wide shoots um, with a recess and vertical drop are great um, for helping shearers put sheep down. Um, if a shoot is a trip hazard in the catching pen, fence it off to stop it um, being a hazard. Um, and I guess putting hanging space for tools and making sure you've got room for the shearers to put all their gear at their stand um, is a great benefit. But um, if you're looking at retrofitting a shed, um, especially you know, if you've got a good relationship with your shearing contractor or you've had the same shearers coming to your place for years, we'd really suggest have a chat with your shearers and shed staff. They're the ones who work in the shed all day every day and they'll usually be able to point out some bits that they think could be working better or things that they've seen in another shed that work really well. So moving on now to safe sheds, and this is some work we did with um, WA Shearing Industry Association, but it's relevant right across Australia. That's just who we worked on with this. Uh, and we just wanted to put together a manual to assist both um, contractors and growers um, with understanding their duty of care obligations uh, for safety in the shed um, and be able to do a self-assessment if they'd like to understand which parts of their shed were up to scratch and which were not and what they could potentially work on. So it's broken into four sections, the first of which is legal obligations of the people working at the shed, um, how to assess and manage the risks, the best practice assessment guide and or assessment checklist. So there's um, assessment checklist but there's also induction checklist for new staff and all of that sort of thing. This is available in hard copy, we've got some of those down at the Sheep Connect SA stand so if you would like to come and grab one of those you're more than welcome. There's also the online PDF at uh, our website at wool.com slash safe sheds or there is also a free app that you can download. Um, the great thing about the app if you're so inclined is um, it does work offline so if you don't have service at your shed no problem just make sure you download it before you go out of service. Um, you can take photos and create notes and all that sort of thing but the great thing is when you're going through um, it asks you you know do you have this or do you have that? If you don't have that in your shed, it'll just stop asking you questions about that. So it'll start self-filtering so you're not having to go through a heap of stuff that's totally irrelevant to your shed. You can also um, share this with multiple accounts. So for example, if you go through this with your shearing contractor and you both go through and do a shed assessment before you start shearing, you can share that. Um, with your contractor, you guys can work together to sort of say, okay, well this year before shearing we might look at fixing X, Y and Z 
and then we can talk about it after next shearing as well. So just a few examples, there's all sorts of things, sort of pretty much every aspect of the shed is really covered under this, you know, from inside to outside, um, presentation of sheep um, to the shearers, welfare questions, all those sorts of things. So um, it really is a fairly comprehensive guide to all the safety and um, best practice measures in the shed. An example there of the induction checklist, so you can put the staff name there to um, comply so that if something does happen, you'll be able to say, you know, we did this, we ran through all of these features of our shed and etc. The Shearing Shed Safety Signage Kit, uh, so this kit has in it um, everything that will meet the minimum standards of the signage that's required in every state in Australia. Um, if you go and buy all those signs individually, it's about $800 worth of signs, but we've got them made um, so that you can grab them from us. Um, so we normally just charge $25 for it for postage. Um, if you come and see me today and ask for one, I will send it to you for free if you would like one. Um, so um, that um, we can definitely get that sent out to you. So some other work we've been looking at doing um, for understanding shear injuries. So. Um, a lot of people say to us, you know, it's the catch and drag or the release that is doing our back injuries. Um, the back injuries in shearing sheds are about 50% of the cost to industry um, in terms of the injury cost. So, um, so back injuries are overwhelmingly the issue and a lot of people are saying, yep, it's either catch and drag or release that's doing it. We didn't actually have any data on that, so we worked with the University of Melbourne and we got one of the guys who actually does a lot of um, work with elite athletes and sports reporting who put all of those wearable sensors all over um, people to understand how their muscles are moving, the rates of fatigue of those muscles, all those sorts of things. So here's a bit of a video. So you can see here, so you can see here, um, you can see that little figurine on the right moving. That's actually the shearer wearing the sensors who's out in the catching pen trying to get the sheep. Um, giving him a bit of curry out the back. <laughs> so here he comes. And so you can see on this shearer, um, he's got, there's a sensor there, that's a sensor on his arm, there's a sensor on his wrist, on his hands, those funny lumps in his back are all sensors. He's got a sensor um, taped around his calf, that gaffer tape has a sensor in it. So to start with, um, we tape these onto a number of shearers that um, they all had to wear them for a month. Um, and so we started off with 33 sensors all over the shearer's body because we wanted to understand what was actually happening. We now have that um, data and so what it tells us is that the catch and drag is actually within the threshold of human movement and it's not actually what's causing the problem. The problem is coming from shearing posture and being bent over basically for, you know, seven and a half hours a day um, because what's happening is when you um, use your muscles, they stretch and relax and stretch and relax and stretch and relax. Basically, when you've been holding that bent over position for such a long time, they've been stretched a lot and they can't come back to where they need to be to support your back once you're upright again. So I guess, so the injuries that we're seeing in a lot of cases at either release or catch and drag are a symptom of putting pressure on the back in a short, sharp burst. So if you're in the catching pen and your muscles have been stretched, they're not as able to hold your back structure together. So you jerk to chase a sheep in the catching pen and that's when it happens because your muscles aren't holding your back structure together. So what we're now looking at is the benefit of work-rest cycles. So will you get a better result if at, um, you know, midway through the third run you have a stretching break for five minutes? Will you, you know, reduce your fatigue to a level that is enough to mean that you are 50% less likely to have an injury or something like that? So we started off with 33 sensors and we're now down to people having to wear four sensors to be able to get this information. So now we're looking into the effectiveness of intervention, um, training and stretching, where the different shed designs have an impact on the likelihood of injury and etc. And so this is the data from that trial. So you can see here, so the higher the dots, the better the muscle recovery is. So you can see here, in run one on the left, muscle recovery is generally not bad, but a fair cluster of dots down the bottom, meaning that muscle recovery isn't great. By run four, you've barely got anything going up into the good range of muscle recovery. 
So you can imagine how that shear is back might look on this data by run four on day five of the week. So, you know, trying to minimise the risk of injuries by better understanding. Another project we're investing in to de-risk shearing um, is um, enhancement of the handpiece. So having a look at, um, at sensors to be able to understand, you know, if the tail or nose of the handpiece is lifting further than what, um, what we would expect. Um, left and right tilt, um, comb and cutter, making sure you're getting a good cut, um, and looking at power as well. A key feature of this handpiece is that it is operated by a battery pack. And so what we're looking at in terms of power is modelling on having at least as much power as a Heinegger Evo, with the safety features as well, with a battery that lasts at least two hours so that a shearer could get through a run. So a um, few, <laughs> few moving parts there that we're trying to make sure happen. Um, but I guess we're looking at this to say, well, you know, could this be a really useful thing for, you know, using on a crutching trailer or, you know, just having in the ute in case you need to clean up a sheep um, out in the paddock or, you know, could there even be application for shearers to actually be able to use this so they don't have to worry about where the down tube is, that sort of thing. So, um, so we're in the early stages of this. Um, that picture there was taken at um, the TAFE site in Dubbo. We had a fair few things being tested that day in terms of the shearing shed stuff. So um, the shearers made a few running adjustments to it. Um, when it started, the, um, the motor was actually on the other side of the belt uh, and they flipped it upside down and moved a few things around to suit themselves um, to do a few um, running repairs. But overall, the feedback was um, that it was working really well, had good power, um, and they'd definitely be interested in um, having a look at it further. So, um, so we'll go back and um, do some running repairs on that and send it back out for testing again. And the last thing that I wanted to share with you that we're also working on is the race delivery design. So this is um, in an effort to um, eliminate the catch and drag. And so this is a modular unit to deliver um, sheep to the shearer. Um, this has been worked on by Haynes Engineering down at Narracourt. And uh, this will, if anyone's heading to Lucendale Field Days, this will be on display at Lucendale Field Days. Um, so I've got a video here to show you, but this, um, this system, um, I guess if we can eliminate the catch and drag and have the sheep delivered directly to the shearer, it might be just another way of eliminating a pressure point in the shed. And, um, and so Haynes, um, Haynes Engineering um, will be selling this. But again, we've worked with these guys and we've got the blueprints and we're just finalising those now. So these blueprints will be freely available to all of industry. Yeah, anyone can grab them. If you've got an engineering firm that you work with that you'd prefer to have build it for you or to have a look at the design and see if you think you can make it better, um, tweak it, um, those will be available and everyone can have access to those. So I'll show you this video now and then um, open to any questions if anyone has any. So I've just got um, all of the AWI research and development contacts there if anyone would like uh, those details or if you don't want to write it down now, come and see me if you'd like anyone's contact details and I can point you in the right direction. But uh, otherwise, thank you very much.